mean, it definitely is, but it wasn't a bridge that <clears throat> I had necessarily wanted. But I am very glad, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know, the people that I've become closer to or talk to now since photographing them. You know, it makes the night a little well, bit Well, are you better. are you famous now in the bar? I mean, have, have I was more famous because I worked there for seven well, years. <laughs> but having one, I mean, let's face it, you were featured in the New York Times right. magazine. I mean, that's extremely prestigious and yeah. uh, certainly was seen all over the country, if not the world. And I would imagine that your life changed with that contest. Um, um, is that true? No, no, it no? hasn't changed that much. Um, I mean, it changed some. In some ways, some people know who I am. Mm -hmm. They didn't know I, who I was, but before. But you know, people would come in the bar and be like, "What are you still doing here?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Well, you know, they. It was a cash prize, but it wasn't that big, you know, right. and it wasn't a job offer. So, you know, I won, and that's great, and I'm totally honored and humbled by it. And right. but life goes on the way it did before. The one thing that it does do is that, you know, as long as I keep working, you know, hard that more doors will open so it's not like the golden door opens up right it's right. a series of a bunch of doors so it's not going to be a you know an immediate payoff you know mm -hmm. it's going to be you know one that takes time to f open up and unfold itself so i'm very you know happy you know to have the New was York it Times was on it my unex resume. unexpected <laughs> it was completely unexpected i yeah. almost didn't enter i didn't I, two teachers told me i should and i just didn't really see the point in it, to be mm -hmm. honest. And um, I sent it out and got it there the day the deadline was and uh, kind of forgot about it. And uh, they called me and I was actually at work. And uh, You I were at the bar? I was at the bar, but I missed the yeah. photograph. But they, I mean, I missed the phone call. <laughs> but they um, left a message and I freaked out. I was like, the New York Times does not call the losers. <laughs> I must have won. <laughs> I was like, maybe I didn't win first place, but yeah. I must have won something. Oh, that must have been so exciting. Yeah, and then um, I was going home. I was, I was in the airport, from the airport, going to Chicago to visit family when I found out that I actually did win first prize. So, yeah, someone up, went up to me and asked me if I won the lotto. And I said, no, it's better than that, because I was <laughs> crying and calling my family. Uh, I was just really yeah. excited. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, it was fun. That's great. Well, tell us a little bit about your journey to photography. I know you're a bit older than the normal undergraduate. Yeah. So you've spent time doing other things yeah. and coming to photography, I guess, after doing other things. Yeah. Um, what did you do? Um, I graduated high school when I was about 17 and uh, about a year early and I was uh, pretty involved in uh, punk rock music and uh, I just um, wanted out of the suburban life that I had. So. I had friends in D.C. that were very involved with the punk rock scene there, and I moved there and um, just kind of worked odd jobs. Were you a musician? I wasn't at first, um, but with punk rock, you can do anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> What do you mean? So I just mean that, you know, there's not this idea that you have to be a trained musician to, you know, to play music or whatever. So me and a... Um, uh, me, we lived in group houses. There were big old houses, and like seven to eight of us would live in it. And uh, two of the guys that I was living with were doing a band, and uh, there was going to be an idea of a changing member. So one time they asked me to be that member to sing, and I can't sing whatsoever. Uh -huh. And uh, one of the guys had an old Barfisa organ, and he said, "Well, do you want to try playing this?" And I said, "Sure." And we had our first show two weeks later in Ohio, and everyone loved us, and we said, "Let's keep it." So, so you I, were the organist. Yeah, I played keyboards in the band. Um, we were called the Delta Twenty Two. So that took up about six years of my life, huh. because um, at the beginning, I, um, you know, we did everything ourselves. Our touring, our our records, we did everything, and then we started to get more popular, and uh, we put out two records. And uh, by the end of it, I was rarely working. I was working at McGlinchey's whenever I was in town, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the rest of the time I was touring, so. So you weren't able to quite make a living off of the band? Just you about. To, just you about. had to work at McGlinchey's. I only worked, yeah, I mean, I did make a living off the band. I worked at McGlinchey's, you know, one day a week by the end of, by the end of the band. So it was fun, we went to Europe. We went to Canada a couple of times, so it did was you, a very. Did you feel this really wasn't your vocation? Or was it that you just? Uh, no, I had a really hard time with the guys in the band towards the end. The personal relationships were falling apart, and uh, or mine was falling apart with them, and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I left the band, and I tried to do another band after that, um, 
and it was just, <laughs> I wasn't 19 anymore, uh-huh. and it was, I was just really hard, and uh, the kids that I was in the band with were where I was, and so I just kind of got pressure with it, and then uh, I started working in, I kept working in McGlinchey's and a couple other bars, and so I did that for about a year, mm-hmm. and uh, after a year of that, I was pretty lost as to what I was doing. I was like, I don't want to be in this the rest of my life. So I decided to go back to school. And I've always loved art. And uh, I wish I had a better reason to study photography, but I can't draw or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the Art Institute and, um, for photography, and I just fell in love with it, you know? So you chose it uh, at that point, and you hadn't taken, you hadn't been interested in photography before? No, I mean, I've always liked art. I've always liked photography, but not enough to actually to do it, so I kind of just fell into it, and, uh, but I fell in love with it. It was the best thing. So did, did you become really passionate about it very quickly when you were at the Art Institute? Yeah, I'm pretty passionate about anything I do. I work pretty hard, so I got fully into it and uh, just loved it, you know. And then when I was at the Art Institute, it's more of a kind of technical vocational school. Right. And uh, it was good for me when I was scared to go back to school, mm-hmm. you know, after I think I after 10 years or something like that, or nine years, I'm not sure. Um, it was pretty intimidating, and I, I didn't know, you know if I really wanted to do it. So it was a two-year program. But once I got into it, I wanted more, and I knew that the Art Institute couldn't give me what I wanted because I wanted more of an education. I wanted to study the history of art. I wanted right. to do the other arts. I wanted a whole rounded education. So that's how I ended up coming to Drexel. Okay. But you didn't take a course in English. No, I didn't take a course in <laughs> English. I really hate to write, to oh. be honest. Oh, That's well. probably why I take pictures. Yeah, once you start writing, though, you'd become obsessed with it, yeah. knowing your <laughs> personality. Do you think of yourself as a driven person? I mean, are you driven? It seems to me that you yeah. know, first with music and now with photography. Yeah. How do you, what drives you? What is it, what is it that you're after? Um, isn't, aren't we all just after <laughs> happiness? <laughs> but uh, uh, Is it happiness? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just have a really strong um, work ethic, and uh-huh. I just uh, really believe in things when I believe in it, and uh, I don't give up very easily. So um, with the photography now, you know, my ultimate goal is to somehow, you know, create a different vision of the world using my photography. So... Um, I really wanted my photography to go beyond me. Like, I don't want it to be this inner, like, bearing of my soul. I'd rather it be um, somehow affecting the outside world. So, does that make sense? <coughs> yes, I do. And I guess that we can talk about your project yeah. now, which is about how capital punishment has affected people. Yeah. Um, and you see this as a departure then from the McGlinchey series? Well, I'm still about? working on the McGlinchey series because. I'm there. <laughs> I'm still at McGlinchey's, mm-hmm. and um, there's a possible book project with it. So um, okay. I would need to, I need more work and to produce more work and maybe broaden the subject a little bit more. So I am still working on that. Um, also, the project that I'm working on, the Death Penalty Project, is um, it's not as, access is a, is, can be a challenge. Right. So in the down, down times of that, I still have the other projects well, to work Well, on. tell us about this project. Maybe you could first give <coughs> us background on how you came to decide to do this. And <laughs> then... I just fall into everything. <laughs> I just kind of fell into um, it. You fell into it. Yeah, I, I did a cross-country bike trip for the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, which is a national um, program that takes money from all over the country and then distributes it back out to grassroots programs that deal with the root causes of poverty, so they wouldn't do like a soup kitchen, it's yeah. more education and stuff like that. One of their pro- so I was all hyped up after doing this trip, and I was like, I'm going to go home and make a difference. And one of the groups that they um, fund is the Pennsylvania Abolitionists United Against the Death Penalty. Mm-hmm. And so um, I decided I was going to do a photo project about the death penalty. So could, <laughs> could you tell us about these? I guess we have four of the uh, yeah. uh, of a group yeah. of photographs. Um, uh, so what I've been doing is <coughs> photographing people that are affected by it, either those that are exonerated um, from death row. Um, at some point, I would really like to get into the prisons and photograph. Yeah. Um, also, the, the murder victims of people who have lost family to murder because of huge um, 
a huge, uh, the biggest thing against, you know, when people say they're for the death penalty is that, you know, if it happened to me, I would want that. Yeah. So I'm trying to show, you know, there are people that are like that and that are not like that. Yeah. And that they think the death penalty even promotes, doesn't help, you know, reconciliation. It mm -hmm. doesn't help moving forward and that by taking another person's life, it doesn't make up for the one that was right. lost. Um, and then also I'm photographing the families who have people on death row because and how that affects not only them but then there's a trickle down effect or trickle up effect into the neighborhood into the community until right. you go all the way onto a national level but so who <coughs> are who are these people um this is Ray Crone he's from he's originally from New York PA um but he was living in um uh, Phoenix Arizona when he was convicted of murdering a bartender and he served 11 years on death row in Arizona. Um, he's been, he was exonerated in 2000 right. and now lives in New York, Pennsylvania with his family again. But he spent 11 years for a crime he never committed and DNA oh. not only proved his innocence but um, pointed, showed the, the real murderer. Okay, and could you tell us, yeah, I'll take this. Sure. Can you, oh, there's yours. Um, this is Nick Yaris. He was exonerated uh, less than a year ago in, I think, January 15th of 2004. He spent um, 23 years in prison in Pennsylvania for a crime he didn't commit. He was exonerated by DNA as well. Mm -hmm. um, he's originally from South West Philadelphia. So he went in when he was about 19 or 20. So. This is Lori Post. His, um, daughter was murdered by her husband um, they live in South Jersey and um, they um, are part of a group called Murder Victims for Reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, it was a huge uh, challenge for them and you know to work on anti-death penalty issues because he regularly works on anti-death penalty issues and does prison work within the prison and the one thing that um, his wife said was that, you know, how could we promote the death penalty? How, what would we tell? Because there's a granddaughter mm -hmm. who's now left without a mother and her, fa and her father's in prison. But, um, you know, mommy killed dad. She told me this and it just blew my mind. But mommy killed daddy, so we killed mommy. But remember that killing is wrong. So it's just a very powerful voice yeah. in, in all of it. Um, this is Michael, his son, Sean, is in uh, prison at Gradaford, which is 45 minutes away, and he was convicted of, a, of murdering people in Reading, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, his son was 19 when he was convicted um, by an all-white jury, and he was painted as a drug lord <laughs> in the trial, but he has no prior conviction of that, and he has no, it was a it was false, it, that didn't occur. But um, at this point, he's the only person on death row <coughs> in Pennsylvania that's charged as an accomplice. He's not charged as a, the actual murderer, mm. so. Uh, this is Mary Ann. She's kind of, um, one thing that is, uh, has been studied and is proven is that there are major racial and economic biases when the death penalty is used. Um, she's one person that um, doesn't necessarily fall into that. But um, her son um, has been on death row. I I'm sorry, I can't remember how long, but she lives in a, you know, uh, middle class family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so. It's a really fascinating project. Thanks. I mean, the fact of getting at it from so many different angles. I think it's really important too because I don't, people like to isolate the death penalty and think, you know, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect, it's very an isolated issue. Right. To me it's not, and to, in order to show that it's not an isolated issue, I want to, you know, bring all these, all these different people that are affected by it into one project because it's not an isolated issue. Right. So it's your turn toward a more activist photography. Yeah, I, you know, I would really like my photography to go along that route. 